100 Years of Auburn Football is presented by the Auburn Football Centennial Committee and these official sponsors of the Auburn Football Centennial. First Alabama Bank. Your Alabama Coca-Cola Bottler. Golden Flake Snack Foods. And Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Alabama. On the plains of Auburn, this is where tradition began. Since 1892, young men have dedicated themselves to football at Auburn. Down through the years, some were blessed with rare gifts of athletic ability. Many possessed even rarer qualities of courage and character. Their deeds on the gridiron are legend, but their accomplishments as Auburn people are what make them true heroes. They have created a legacy that transcends the decades. This is their story and the story of all Auburn men and women who share their hopes, dreams, and glory. Glory for Auburn. Now here's Solomon, first and ten. He's going to fake the under, he's going to throw the ball against the green, complete. Beasley broke away, 45, 50, 40. You are the champion of the best football conference in America. <laughs> Seidel pitches out to the left halfback, Fredrickson gets the block, goes to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Tucker Fredrickson. Back, back, run like a wild man. Wild man turned to loose. Be sharp, be ready. Pat's going to leave it with Bow, and he's going to break a tackle, and he's going to break another tackle, 35-40. Down the sidelines, we've got a foot race at the 40, the 30, the 20. Bye-bye, Bow! Take it inside. Bowman keeps on the option. He's taking some to the 35-40. 45-50. Look to the 45-40. He's at the 35-40. He's over the 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 this is 100 years of Auburn football. When the commitment is deep enough and the faith is strong enough, Impossible dreams can come true. They trail seven to three. Flack's got one set back and four wide receivers. Desperation play. Flack's gonna throw in the end zone. Gotta be wide open. Larson, he's got it. Touchdown, Auburn! Touchdown, Auburn! Touchdown, Auburn! The Tigers' improbable victory over Florida in 1989 was just one of many memorable moments in the 100-year history of Auburn football. Throughout the decades, Auburn has built a tradition of excellence that is virtually unmatched in college football. It is one of the select few schools in the country to have won more than 500 games in its history. Fittingly, victory number 500 came in a 1987 New Year's Day bowl game against another national power, Southern California. It also came in a decade when the Tigers enjoyed their greatest success in the Southeastern Conference. More P5 
people became part of the Auburn experience than ever before. But Auburn tradition did not begin in the 1980s. It is a 19th century legacy that has been shared by all that have worn the orange and blue. Although much has changed in 100 years, the landmarks that illuminate the path to the birth of Auburn football are easy to find. In the 1890s, at Alabama Agricultural and Mechanical College, Alabama A&M, Samford Hall was the focus of campus activities. Toomer's Drugstore already stood at the crossroads that marked the center of the loveliest village on the plain. In 1891, the college's young history professor, George Petrie, traveled to Johns Hopkins to obtain his doctorate. His experiences there would influence much more than his scholarly pursuits. He had gotten interested in football. He had seen some games in Baltimore. And one of his closest friends at Johns Hopkins went to the University of Georgia. Petrie had the idea of organizing the first football game in the Deep South and wrote his friend at Georgia. They organized the first game. Petrie coached the first team. Petrie played running back on the first team coached the team to a 2-2 record, which is not the greatest record in the world for professional football coaches, but for historians, it's pretty good. So he is really a legendary figure in the history both of Auburn football and Auburn higher education. Petrie's charges won that first game with Georgia 10 to nothing, and thus began one of the greatest rivalries in all of sports. The following year, Auburn had the unique distinction of beating Alabama twice, once in February and again in November. A succession of coaches followed Dr. Petrie until the immortal John Heisman arrived in 1895. The inventor of the forward pass put the program on solid ground. The team routinely practiced in the open plain behind Samford Hall, what is now Ross Square. It was at that location in 1896 that the Tigers defeated Georgia Tech 45 to nothing in the first game ever played on the Auburn campus. The first great era in Auburn football began in 1905 with the appointment of coach Mike Donahue he made an immediate impact, going undefeated in his first season. Iron Mike was a spirited leader who loved Auburn and his players. His ability to outthink rather than out-hit opponents led to three Southern Association championships. At one point, his teams won 23 straight games, still the longest winning streak in school history. During the Donahue era, Auburn's football was played on Drake Field, which was laid out just east of Jordan-Hare Stadium in what is now the area of the Haley Center parking lot. It would remain home for the Tigers until 1939. The old half stadium is now was the old, old gully, and across up on top, just about where the press box is now, was the old abattoir where they had the dead animals at the vet department. And of course, on a, on a day when the wind was blowing in either direction, when we were practicing football or practicing baseball, we could really get the good odors there. The facility was modest, to say the least. The only seats we had were temporary bleachers that we put up uh, in 1st of September. We had one gate down there on that old oak tree and uh, a little ticket booth, and that uh, we sold what we call big, a book strip ticket, just like you used to at the picture show, you know, roll, general admission. And uh, we had one game a year, you know, not every year, but most years. The lack of an on-campus stadium in the 20s and 30s led Auburn to play most of its games on the road. 
Home games were played in Columbus, Montgomery, or at Legion Field in Birmingham. Ironically, it was a have-not situation that would impact the history of Auburn football for almost 40 years. The team often traveled by train, even on a West Coast trip in 1936. We played Georgia in uh, Columbus on a Saturday afternoon. Beat them 21 to 14, as I remember. Left that night by train going to San Francisco to play Santa Clara. Uh, on, as you say, on the way we worked out, I think maybe on Sunday afternoon, we worked out in Mobile, and uh, we worked out in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and we worked out in uh, Tucson, Arizona, and, and uh, Los Angeles. What they would do was unhook the, usually two cars, that we had the ball club on. It unhooked that, and we'd practice, and somebody would pick us up. It was pretty well uh, set up the way that <laughs> it had to be, or else we'd been left in the desert. Despite the hardships, the Tigers fielded some very competitive teams in the 1930s. In 1932, Jimmy Hitchcock, a triple threat as a passer, runner, and punter, became the Tigers' first All-American. Jimmy was not a big fella. He weighed about 170 pounds. He was about 5'11". He didn't have what we term today as blinding speed, but he had a great change of pace. He could be running full speed. This is from trusting my memory now. In, in, in my mind, I picture him. He'd be running full speed, and the tackle would be closing in on him, and he'd look like he'd almost stop dead, and the tackle would go by, and he'd take off and go again. Jimmy's younger brother, Billy, number 24 for the Tigers, was a tough, hard-nosed player in his own right. In 1936, he played a prominent role in leading Auburn to its first and perhaps most unique postseason bowl appearance. The Tigers were selected to play in the Bacardi Bowl. It took place in Havana, Cuba as part of a national sports festival. It was almost canceled because of a revolution led by dictator General Batista. The day of the game, uh, as you mentioned, they had a lot of troops, they had a lot of guns. And when Batista, who was a dictator at that time came in, they shoved us off to one side of the field and let, let the uh, troops walk in with him. There was no trouble shoving, believe me, we moved in a hurry. I don't like the look of those guns anyway. After the ceremonies, number 33, All-America Walter Gilbert would lead the Tigers against a strong Villanova team. But this hard-fought contest ended in a 7-7 tie. The Tigers coach was a former Notre Dame man named Jack Marr. Coach Marr was a, a real quiet, soft-spoken man, which, don't, don't get me wrong, he was tough. He was tough as he could be. He was not very big. He was about 5'4", five, 5'. But he was wound up pretty tight. Had a very clipped conversation and never used any, any, uh, any curse words on the field. Very seldom raised his voice, about as loud as he ever got on the voice. Says, all right, boys, all right, let's go, let's go, let's go. But he was a, he was a fine man and, and, and really a great coach. Coach Marr continued the tradition of Auburn defense established by Mike Donahue. It was not uncommon for his teams to record four or five shutouts in a season. With the help of a young assistant named Shug Jordan, defense became a synonym for Auburn football in the 30s. Auburn played Georgia at Memorial Stadium in Columbus for more than 40 years. The stadium has changed little since that first Georgia game was played there in 1916. Although it seats 18,000, 
Even in the 40s and 50s, the facilities left something to be desired. My high school had better dressing rooms than they had it, uh, over in Columbus. It was just uh, a real small room and, and uh, had one bench. You, you dressed and went outside and let somebody else sit down so they could dress. It was, it was that small. The whole squad couldn't get in there at one time. The Auburn Georgia weekend was always a grand event in the city of Columbus. But for Auburn, there was never a more exciting game than the one in November of 1942. The Bulldogs, led by Heisman Trophy quarterback Frank Sinkwich, were heavy favorites. They were headed for the Rose Bowl and might have won a national championship had it not been for Auburn. Coach Marr, in his final season as head coach, prepared a masterful game plan, which the Tigers executed flawlessly. The defense suffocated Sinkwich and held Georgia to only 37 yards rushing. Auburn's offense attacked with the explosive running of All-American Monk Gafford. He frustrated the Bulldogs at every turn, piling up 119 yards on the ground. Before his career concluded, he became Auburn's first 1,000-yard rusher setting the standard for future legends like James, Lorino, Brooks, Cribs, and Jackson. Auburn fans savored this stunning 27 to 13 upset. It would be their last major victory before world events turned thoughts away from football for much of the decade. After World War II, the Tigers struggled to get back on their feet. Auburn fans cheered for first downs instead of touchdowns as they searched for a hero for whom to cheer. That long sought hero came in the person of Travis Tidwell, a cocky, charismatic quarterback who could, as they say, do it all. He was an immediate hit with the fans and the media. This guy named Art Sidney with the old Birmingham Post uh, nicknamed me the Paul during that freshman year. P-A-W, Tiger's Paul. And that didn't stick, though. My, my nickname that stuck with me was Traveling Travis. It takes only one look at Ted Will in action to see why that nickname stuck. Only one freshman gained more yards rushing than Travis. And that was Bo Jackson. I was willing to put out the extra that it took to excel. Most guys, even in high school, uh, when, when the practice was over and they would go in, I would stay out there for another 10 or 15 minutes and run sprints and do the little extra things that the ordinary guy wouldn't do. In 1949, Tidwell and the Tigers gave Auburn one of its greatest triumphs. The Auburn-Alabama rivalry had resumed the year before. Alabama won that game handily, and no one gave Auburn a chance. There was a crowd of Alabama supporters outside uh, in the parking area, outside uh, when we were getting on the bus. And they had had a few, uh, uh, and they were obviously under the influence uh, somewhat, and uh, they were had handfuls of bills dollar bills, uh, shaking them like that, that we're going to whip y'all, you know, and we're giving uh, so many points, you know, and all that. And, I, of course, all of us saw that, obviously, and heard it, and that had a lot to do uh, that, to get us ready for that football game if we wasn't already ready. And uh, it, was a, it was a best pep talk 
that wasn't a pep talk, the coaches couldn't have done that to get us as fired up as that did. The Tigers seized an early 7-0 lead on a Johnny Wallace interception return for a touchdown. But this game would feature the kind of fourth quarter pressure that has characterized these tests of will ever since. With Alabama just one point from tying the game, Travis Tidwell stepped forward once again. And I was on the uh, bench and I ran up to Coach Brown. I said, Coach, I gotta get in there and, uh, and, and rush the kicker. And he said, well, okay, Travis, go ahead. So I went in, lined up at one end, and to this day I say that I caught Salem's eye and put the hoodoo on him. <laughs> and made him hurry that kick and he missed it. <laughs> The 14 to 13 victory revived the spirits of Auburn people. Coach Earl Brown was a hero after the victory over Alabama, but he would never win another game. On February 25th, 1951, Ralph Shook Jordan was hired to resurrect Auburn football. The rest, as they say, is history. Although history may not have been written so eloquently without the foresight of athletic director Jeff Beard. He believed in Shug and took his case directly to Auburn president, Dr. Ralph Drawn. Wilson called us meeting together and I was sitting out there. He said, Jeff, what are you doing in here? I said, I come to see about a new coach. He said, well, you're not a member of the committee. I said, I know, Fessor, but I look at it this way. Whoever you hire, he makes good, it's fine. I said, if he doesn't do a good job, you're going to call on me to fire him. And if I got to fire him, I want to have a say on who it's going to be. He said, well, that makes sense. Go ahead and vote. When the meeting ended, Suge Jordan was the new head coach. So I went out on the front veranda of it. Predators match and it was the yard was full of all the boys and people and I, I took Shug with him and introduced him as a new head coach and boy they tore up the town. Finally, by a very close vote, they decided to give the opportunity to an Auburn man. Uh, coach Jordan uh, was that and was always that. And uh, back in those days, it was uh, always uh, it seemed to be the better wisdom. Uh, to go out and find somebody as far as way as you can. And, and usually, if you were from Notre Dame, it all automatically meant you were a great coach. Well, finally, they made a decision, you know, let's, let's give an Auburn man a try. Shug had been an Auburn man from the first day he arrived on campus as a student in 1928. As head coach, he immediately set out to change the attitude of Auburn players. We started out uh, surprising everybody. We beat a real fine Vanderbilt team with an All-American Bill Wade on it that had beaten Auburn, I think, something like 49 to nothing the year before. Broke an SEC record in the first game that may not even be broken today. Over 90 offensive plays uh, in a ball game. Three yards in a cloud of dust. <laughs> Didn't let Wade <laughs> have the ball enough to to, uh, to beat us, and uh, we beat them 24 to 14. And I think uh, that changed uh, attitudes here at Auburn about whether Auburn could win, whether Coach Jordan was, uh, you know, the guy for the job. Auburn people quickly realized that Suge Jordan was the perfect man for the job. In just three years, the Tigers were headed to a bowl game. It was 1953, the year of the famous X and Y teams. 
That season, Coach Jordan alternated two completely different offensive backfields, led by two very different quarterbacks. Freewheeling Bobby Freeman guided one unit. While senior captain Vince Dooley commanded the other. Dooley provided inspired leadership throughout the season. He was gaining valuable insight into the game from the master teacher, Coach Jordan. The last game being the Gator Bowl, I guess uh, maybe I played my best because when I got off the bus afterwards, Coach Jordan said, well, you, you saved your best for last. And that was something that was very special to me. Uh, and it also made me realize that as a coach, you must always be accountable for what you say because your players are listening. And what you say, either positive or negative, will have a lifetime impact. And I remember some things that, uh, that, that what he said there had this lifetime impact on me. With success came recognition for Auburn athletes. Tackle Frank D'Agostino. End Jim Pyburn. And fullback Joe Childress were named All-Americans. Childress almost single-handedly beat fifth-ranked Miami in 1954. He gained more than 160 yards, scored two touchdowns, and kicked the extra points that gave the Tigers a 14-13 victory. He shared the backfield with Bob James, number 23. In formation, handed off to Bob James, the left halfback. James breaks to the outside, straight on one tackle. And the 40-yard line comes back up the sideline. Look at that boy, two up the yardage. One man between him and the goal line, and he reverses his field. But slows down his feet, is struck from behind. James, who would later be elected governor of Alabama, was Auburn's all-time career rushing leader well into the 1970s. This nucleus of talent would lead the Tigers back to national acclaim. But first, they had to clear one last hurdle, the Grant Phil Jinx. Georgia Tech was Auburn's biggest rival and greatest nemesis. Going into the 1955 game, Tech had won 15 straight games at Grant Field in Atlanta. This Saturday, the Tigers would not be intimidated. They would not be denied. Number 44, Alton Shell, gave Auburn the early advantage. But when Tech came back to take the lead in the fourth quarter, the experts said the jinx lives on. I was sitting up with Hal Herring on the telephone on top of the Tech press box. And there were some other guys over here from scouting from some other school and some press that had extra press that was up there too. And every, we could hear every one of them say, same old thing, Auburn's going to do it again. They just say, Grant Field Jinx. Everybody believed it but the Auburn team and the Auburn coaches. And we took that ball and crammed it down their throat on a, on a long drive, scored the touchdown, and in the fourth quarter, Georgia Tech never got past the 50-yard line. The breaking of the jinx signaled a significant shift of power in the Southeastern Conference. Auburn was becoming a major force, a fact that would soon be recognized throughout all of college football. This quiet village on the plain became the focus of national attention in 1957. 
That year, API joined a short list of schools whose college football teams had won a national championship. The Tigers' success was unprecedented. In just seven seasons, they had been transformed from winless cellar dwellers to undefeated champions. Like so many success stories, this one began clouded in adversity. The only experienced quarterback we had that year was uh, a quarterback that got into discipline problems during the summer and Coach Jordan had dismissed the quarterback. And that was another tough decision. When you dismiss for discipline reasons, the only quarterback with any experience, I mean, that, that takes some real tough, high-valued disciplinary action, which he did. The team stood behind Coach Jordan's tough decision and rallied around a new quarterback, a converted halfback named Lloyd Nix from Little Kansas, Alabama. Uh, going into the season, we had Tennessee in three weeks, and a uh, quarterback had never had taken a snap before. And really, we just didn't know what to expect out of him. But he came through. He uh, couldn't run, he couldn't pass, he, uh, but he won. And uh, he didn't make any mistakes. And he was probably uh, responsible for us being national champions. With Nix at quarterback, the Tigers played it close to the vest on offense. Scoring would not be their forte. The strategy was simple. Control the ball, don't make mistakes, and let the defense take care of the rest. All we wanted was to get either three points or six points, and we, we uh, had enough confidence in each other in the defense to, uh, uh, we thought we had the game won. Their confidence was justified. This was the finest defense in Auburn history. In 10 games, the unit allowed only 28 points. All-America and Jimmy Red Phillips and two sophomores named Jackie Burkett and Zeke Smith were its cornerstones. Week in and week out, it refused to be beaten. Against Kentucky, Georgia, and Georgia Tech, its fourth quarter heroics preserved shutout victories. As Georgia Tech had the ball on the Auburn 14 yard line, Fred Brasselton back to pass. There's a fumble and Jimmy Phillips recovers. So the alert play of the Auburn team on the defense has saved off a possible score by Georgia Tech. Red Phillips was perhaps the finest two-way player in Auburn history. Despite his defensive prowess, he was best known for his big play offensive capabilities. He led the SEC in receiving in 1957, averaging more than 23 yards per catch. The unsung hero of this championship team was Billy Atkins. His two touchdowns pulled out a come-from-behind victory over Mississippi State, the only game where Auburn trailed all season long. His field goal provided the only scoring against Georgia Tech. No matter what it took, the Tigers kept winning. A six to nothing victory over Georgia finally put them at the top of the national rankings. Undefeated and untied, Auburn faced Alabama in the final game of the year. With pride and the national title on the line, 
they played like the champions they were and coasted to a 40 to nothing victory. All they could do now was wait for the results of the final voting the following Monday to make their accomplishment official. Sports Information Director Bill Beckwith received the official word at 4.30 p.m. and the celebration began. Probably hadn't got enough time to tell you what it really meant to me. It meant everything to me. I was just uh, glad I had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, take a part in it and, and uh, be on that team and play with some fine athletes like we had and play for a fine coach like we had. It was perhaps the greatest era in Auburn football. From 1956 through 1958, API would go 24 straight games without a defeat, still the best in school history. The 1957 defense set records that have never been equaled. It produced Auburn's first Outland Trophy winner, Zeke Smith, in 1958 and an offensive and defensive All-American and number one draft pick in both the NFL and AFL, Ken Rice. These young men were champions then, as they are today, and will be forever. In 1962, a pair of talented sophomores quickly captured the hearts of Auburn fans. They were Jimmy Seidel and Tucker Fredrickson, the first of two dynamic duos that would dominate the history of Auburn football in the 1960s and early 70s. Seidel was a highly recruited quarterback out of Birmingham who always wanted to play for the Tigers. He became the first quarterback in college football history to lead the nation in rushing when he gained over 1,000 yards in 1963. Beside him in the backfield was All-America Tucker Fredrickson one of the finest athletes to ever wear the orange and blue. Great, great football player all around. Probably the most devastating safety man that uh, has been in the Southeastern Conference ever. Uh, great, uh, great runner, but we didn't have the strength in our line, uh, quite frankly, when he was a, a junior and a senior that, it, that would have helped him a lot more as a ball carrier uh, from the line of scrimmage. But he was a breakaway runner, a great pass receiver, uh, just a great all-around athlete. Uh. Despite being picked to finish sixth in the conference in 1963, the Tigers won nine of 10 games that season, due in large part to the contributions of Seidel and Fredrickson. Their best effort came in a classic confrontation against Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Split. Seidel pitches out to the left halfback. Fredrickson gets the block, goes to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Tucker Fredrickson! Tech came in as a 10-point favorite, but Seidel ran around and passed over the rambling wreck defense like it wasn't there. Both Seidel and Fredrickson gave true All-America performances. Auburn triumphed 29 to 21 
in one of the most emotional victories in Coach Jordan's career. The Tigers were on their way to nine victories and a berth in the Orange Bowl, their first bowl appearance since 1955. But first, they settled a score with the Crimson Tide. Despite losing Jimmy Seidel early in the game, Auburn won 10 to eight, its first victory over Alabama in five years. In the last year of that decade, another dynamic duo would once again bring the Tigers back to the heights of that unforgettable year of 1963. And here's Sullivan faking to Henley. Sullivan's going to go very long for Beasley. He's there. Touchdown, <laughs> Pat Sullivan and Terry Beasley. A true all-American success story. In 1968, the Tigers clawed their way to a 7-4 record. It earned them a bowl bid and secured All-America honors for number 70 defensive tackle David Campbell. Sullivan and Beasley were only on the freshman team, yet Auburn fans were already anticipating their varsity debut the following September. I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't expectations or people didn't talk because I was highly recruited coming out of high school and then the freshman uh, the way we we played back then and we were down 27 to nothing to Alabama and uh, came back and beat them in Bryant Denning which was the first time that uh, that had happened uh, to Alabama uh, in about six or seven years on the freshman or the varsity level so people were talking about it and there was you know great expectations and then playing your first game in Jordan Hare as a, as a sophomore against Wake Forest and uh, Auburn had basically been a running football team and uh, dropped back to throw the first pass and the adrenaline was f flowing and I go by the guy because they had nowhere thinking that we were going to be passing and it was a fake you know play action and Pat hauls off and throws it I know he throws it further than I ever saw him throw it and I thought I think it bounced one time it went about 20 rows up in the stands but and I was about 20 yards open but I really believe if he'd have handed me the ball I'd have dropped it because we were both so keyed up, and people cheered for at least 15 minutes. And I remember going back to the huddle and people standing and cheering. It was the greatest feeling. This duo would go on to become the greatest passing combination in Auburn history. Terry Beasley still holds the Tigers' all-time record for most receptions in a career. Pat Sullivan could tell at their first meeting this would be a winning combination. The summer prior to us coming to, to Auburn in, in 68, Terry came up and, and spent several days with Johnny Musso and, and Phil Cochran and myself, and we worked out before going and playing in, in the old high school All-Star game. And uh, so that's when I, I had the first opportunity to, to get to know Terry. and. Uh, you know, at, at that time, uh, you could tell he was certainly something special because he could run faster than anybody you'd ever been around. And, uh, he had a great physical ability and the, the want to, and uh, I knew it was going to be a lot of fun to be able to throw to him. Pat Sullivan's passing records have also lasted more than 20 years. He obviously had great ability, but the reason for his success was more in his head than in his arm. I saw immediately that he didn't mind taking charge as a sophomore. You know, he showed a, uh, and demonstrated a great maturity uh, at that age because in those days you, you couldn't play until you were a sophomore, so it wasn't too often too many sophomores kind of got into the thick of things and, and, uh, and made things happen. Pat's a very giving person and uh, a team-oriented person and uh, probably one of the strongest human beings I've ever seen react under pressure. Seemed like the more the pressure, the better he gets. 
Sullivan and Beasley made a major impact on Auburn's success in 1969. But that year's Alabama game belonged exclusively to the seniors. Coach Jordan was a little superstitious at times, and he was real slow to change. And I went in to ask him if, in fact, our senior group could come out on the field, uh, just like Alabama did, to represent uh, Auburn as captains for the Auburn-Alabama game. And uh, he didn't respond immediately. He said, let me think about it. I'll get back with you, because uh, he wanted to, you know, as I said, he was, he was kind of superstitious and slow to make changes like that. But he consented to doing it. And uh, I think that really uh, was a statement for you know, our senior class and for Auburn as well, that we were you know, a team, we were unified, we had good senior leadership, and we wanted to demonstrate it uh, in a lot of different ways. And, and the greatest way was that we ended up 49 to 26 against the Tide. Mike Colon and his teammates gave Auburn fans a day to remember. They vented five years of frustration that day. This would not be a nail biter. But in the fourth quarter, Tiger fans witnessed the most famous ad lib in Auburn football history. We had the ball on our own 14 yard line and it was like fourth and six and I, I go in to punt and I'm standing on the goal line. Of course, I don't see anything in the huddle to anybody. All I do is catch the ball and I look up and not a soul from Alabama comes across the line of scrimmage. And I pause for a second and all of a sudden my mind just goes haywire and I stuck it under my arm and took off down the sidelines with it. On the one yard line, we've just done a little figuring ourselves, remembering a Tennessee game was 41. Hey, Frederick's gonna run the ball. Frederick's gonna run it. He's over the 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, midfield. He might go all the way. He's got one man to beat at the Alabama 30. He does. He's gonna run for a touchdown. Connie Frederick has just run for a touchdown on a fake punch. And the fans are all over. Everybody was just screaming and I was tired. Man, I was give out. I didn't know if I had enough energy to get out of the end zone. And I, I guess adrenaline got me back to the sidelines and everybody was cheering and screaming and beating on my helmet and patting me on the back and the coaches came over and were shaking my hand, except Coach Jordan. And until the day he died, he never said a word to me about that play. On October 31st, 1970, the Florida Gators were the victims of an unprecedented aerial bombardment. Sullivan and Beasley had scored a direct hit. It was the finest combined performance of their careers. When it was over, the Tigers had pulled off a 63 to 14 victory. Sullivan threw for 366 yards. Beasley scored four touchdowns. And James Owens, the first black football player in Auburn history, returned a punt for 89 yards and a touchdown. The 63 points are still the most ever scored by Auburn on an SEC opponent. The Tigers appeared to be on a roll to the Sugar Bowl, but when they stumbled against Georgia, Coach Jordan responded with a unique way to prepare for Alabama. Came over to, to Sewell Hall on Monday expecting Coach Freeman to tell us that you're off. And he's out there on the board and he draws up the, the wish, full house wishbone and he draws up the dive and the option. Uh, being a little smart aleck, I guess, I said, yeah, I said, I guess that's uh, what we're going to run against Alabama. He said, no. He said, the man wants to know who wants to go play Alabama. So uh, long story short, we went out on our 40-yard AstroTurf on Monday in full pads, and we scrimmaged on Monday, and 
Uh, we scrimmaged on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, and that's that's all it was. And uh, Coach Jordan, uh, you know, had a way uh, of getting getting his players motivated, and, and we lost some key people to injury, and we're moving different people around. But I think our football team grew through that experience. The Tigers faced a fired-up Alabama team in Birmingham. After falling behind 17 to nothing in the first quarter, they found the courage and determination they had developed in those grueling practices. They came back to claim the only victory that really mattered. Big third down play, Sullivan rolling, throwing up the middle, complete to the tight end at the five, in for a touchdown, Robbie Robinette. The first time Robin has gone to the tight end today, and there are no penalty flags. The 33-28 win was a triumph of spirit, the kind of victory Coach Jordan cherished the most. In 1971, Pat Sullivan would claim the ultimate honor for a college football player, the Heisman Trophy. Many believed he clinched the award with a near-perfect performance in Athens, Georgia on November 13th. Uh, it all started uh, on our way to, to Athens on Friday afternoon. We were in the buses. And about 20 miles outside of town, all the students uh, started surrounding our buses in their car and hollering and screaming and carrying on, and they were having a big time. And uh, you know, you you could just feel a hush come over over our football team. I imagine it'd be like going to war when you're fixing to hit the beachhead. But there was that quiet confidence that that we had. On third down, here is Sullivan rolling to throw. The rush is after him. He threw it while he was hit. He has the man. Touchdown! Although the Bulldogs stayed stubbornly close, in the end, Sullivan and Beasley would do their magic one final time. Now here's Sullivan, first and ten. He's going to fake to under. He's going to throw the ball against the green. Complete. Beasley broke away. 45, 50, 40. He's going down the sideline. They're not going to catch Terry Beasley. It's an over touchdown. Terry Beasley has just gone for the touchdown. The Tigers prevailed 35 to 20. All Sullivan and his teammates could do now was wait for the Heisman announcement. The winner is Pat Sullivan of Auburn University. Hey, Pat Sullivan, congratulations. congratulations, Pat. I knew and do know that, you know, any award that I won was because of, of the people on, on our team and the coaches. And I think they felt a part of it. And then when the announcement of the Heisman was made, one of the special moments I have in my life is when our whole football team was over um, in the lobby of, of um, the Coliseum. And, you know, they felt like they, they had won part of it, which they did. You know, I've said it many times before, and I'll say it again tonight. I wish all of my teammates could be here because each time you go out on the football field, it's not just one or two, it's the entire group. And I wish all of them who I've been so fortunate to play with over these past three years could be here with me tonight to accept something that they all had part in. Coach Jordan, who's been my head coach, and our other assistant coaches have done such a fantastic job of preparing us. And I just thank them from the bottom of my heart. One other thing I would like to say before I sit down. I'm sure that there are probably many Heisman Award winners who deserve this honor more than I. But from the bottom of my heart, I can tell you that none will appreciate it any more than myself. Thank you. In 1972, the cupboard appeared to be bare. There didn't appear to be a single star on the roster. No one expected anything from this team, except the team itself. Coach Jordan did a real good job of, of making us feel like that uh, 
we could become something way above the, what people were expecting. Uh, that there was a lot more to this team uh, than just Sullivan and Beasley, and that um, we were just um, brave enough to believe in what he said. This was Coach Jordan's 22nd team in Auburn. It was to become his favorite. It was picked to finish seventh in the conference. But he wouldn't stand for that. He challenged this team to win, and it did, ending the year with 10 victories and a top five national ranking. They were the Amazons. Week after week, they defied the experts. Going into the Alabama game, they were eight and one. Still, no one believed in them. It was a team that had an attitude and atmosphere of, of being totally relaxed, but it had as a team that had a temperament of, I'll show you that I can. And uh, it, was as, it was a team that had a lot of people who, who knew how to cut up, but knew how to be serious. And, uh, it was loose as a goose, and uh, people who knew that if, if, if the brakes just happened to go their way, they could win. Against Alabama, it appeared as if the Tigers' courage, honor, and character would not be enough. With just over nine minutes left in the third quarter, the Crimson Tide extended their lead to 16 points. 16 to nothing. The Tigers finally got on the board with a Gardner Jet field goal midway in the fourth quarter, but it appeared to be too little, too late. This is the only time in the history of the Auburn Alabama series, to my knowledge, that both sides of Legion Field stood up and booed uh, for entirely different reasons. The Auburn crowd stood up and booed because they felt like perhaps we had quit. We felt we couldn't win the ball game. The Alabama side uh, stood up and booed because if we kicked it, that blew the line, so to speak, which was 14 points, and that would have cut it to three. Despite the seemingly insurmountable odds, Auburn never quit. With five minutes, 30 seconds left in the game, they forced what would become a fateful punt from deep in Alabama territory. Mitchell and Langer on the line of scrimmage coming from either side to try to block the kick. Auburn trying to go after it. Here's a snap. They got it. Block kick. Balls back to the 25. Picked up on the bounce at the 25-yard line. And in for a touchdown is David Langer. They had closed to within a touchdown. But it was too much to expect another miracle. Or was it? On the far right, Roger Mitchell on the left. And Auburn is again going after the kick, as you might imagine. Greg Gant standing on his own 30. Auburn will try to block it. Auburn going after it. Here's a good snap. It is blocked! It is blocked! It's caught on the run! It's caught on the run! He's going to score! David Wagner! David Wagner is scored! And Auburn is tied the game! Roger Mitchell blocked the game! It was an amazing finish to an amazing season. 17 to 16 Auburn. Who would have ever believed it? In the locker room jubilation after the game, Coach Jordan rated this team as his favorite. Some of the young players on this squad would end their careers playing on Coach Jordan's final bowl team in 1974. One was number 42, Mike Fuller, an unimposing defensive back who made himself into an All-American and became the Tigers' finest punt return man of all time. It was something that I saw as a great tool because if I could average at least a first down every time I touched the ball, 
and occasionally break a line or break one for a touchdown. I looked at it as very important too for our team. Uh, that was something that uh, was a lot of fun and to me uh, I had no fear of doing. I look back now and realize just how crazy I was. The 74 Tigers won 10 games, including a 27-3 Gator Bowl victory against Texas. Little did they know that Coach Jordan would announce his retirement the following April and coach just one more season, his 25th. All right, Landman, Landman, that's the way to get off with the football. Backs, backs, run like a wild man. Wild man turned to loose. Be sharp, be ready. Let's go. Come on, let's run it again. The final chapter contained no last second miracles. Perhaps nothing could have topped what had gone before. For 25 years as head football coach, Coach Shug Jordan defined the Auburn experience. I certainly will miss football, I guess. Uh, all I know I will. I'll miss uh, the, uh, the competition. I'll miss the young people that play the game. I'll miss the preparation. I'll miss all the excitement. I'll miss the adrenaline. But I don't think I'm so old that the adrenaline still won't flow as I watch Auburn football teams play. Shug Jordan set an impeccable standard of excellence and enriched the lives of everyone he touched. He was the ultimate Auburn man. First thing, Coach Jordan was known as the man around the dorm. That was the kind of respect that he had. But yet Coach Jordan was close to uh, his players and coaches and, and they felt that warmth he was always just as genuine. Uh, if you met him uh, after a loss, or if you met him after a big win, uh, he was a, he was the same Coach Jordan. He was a man of great compassion and, and, a, and a very gentle man. And yet, when he had to be tough, he could do it without being overbearing. Coach Jordan said two things to me when I signed the scholarship. You're here, number one, to get an education, and number two, to play football, and in that order. In his office, he said to me, you, my office is always open to all of you. And I, that was enough for me. As chairman of the Board of Trustees of Auburn University and as governor of Alabama, it is my pleasure to announce that henceforth this stadium shall be known as the Jordan Hare Stadium. In 1973, Cliff Hare Stadium was renamed Jordan Hare Stadium and became the first stadium in the country to be named for an active head coach. It was a fitting tribute to the man whose success led to the addition of more than 40,000 seats during his tenure as head coach. Auburn did not even have a stadium until 1939. It opened November 30th with a game against Florida. Dick McGowan passed for the only touchdown in a 7-7 tie. Since it seated only 7,500 fans, most games continued to be played on the road. In 1949, the East Stands were added, and the facility was renamed in honor of Dr. Cliff Hare, a distinguished chemistry professor and a member of Auburn's first football team in 1892. It was during Coach Jordan's tenure and that of athletic director Jeff Beard that the stadium became a first-rate facility. By 1970, it had been transformed into a totally enclosed bowl, seating 61,000. As it grew, Auburn opponents, one by one, reluctantly agreed to play the Tigers on their home turf. 
In 1960, Georgia played at Cliff Air Stadium for the first time. The Bulldog defense featured a feisty guard named Pat Dye. But Auburn All-America Ed Dias booted three field goals to beat the Bulldogs 9-6. In 1974, Tennessee finally traveled to Auburn. Coach Jordan urged the team to protect Jordan Hare as if it were their home. They did, and trounced the Volunteers 21 to nothing. The 70s and 80s saw the stadium's capacity swell to more than 85,000. But it would be 1989 before the last of Auburn's traditional foes came to the plains. In the late 1970s, Auburn became recognized as running back U. Coach Doug Barfield had developed an offense that showcased the immense talents of three of the greatest running backs in Auburn history. James Brooks, Joe Cribbs, and William Andrews. When I first met William, I thought he was the, the finest looking, I mean, I thought he was like the greatest looking athlete I had ever seen because he was he was big, he was fast, he was strong, and uh, had great work habits. While Andrews relied on power, Cribs and Brooks grabbed the headlines with speed and quickness. They take it inside. Sotman keeps on the option. He takes it to Brooks at the 35, 40. 45, 50. Brooks at the 45, 40. He's at the 35. He may go all the way. 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown. What a run by James Brooks. I think James Brooks was a lot like Andrews in the sense that they're very extroverted, very uh, talkative, very confident, to the almost to the point of being cocky. James Brooks made runs that broke games wide open. He had the ability to break an 80-yarder any time he touched the ball. With Cribs alongside Brooks in 1979, they both gained over 1,000 yards. Of the three, Cribs was perhaps the most versatile. Joe Cribs um, is kind of between, I would, I would, if you characterize them on a scale, you've got William as a power back, James Brooks as more of a, not really a scat back because he's got power too, but James as, as a, a consummate tailback, if you will. And then Joe Cribs is a little bit of both because he could play fullback if he had to because he was big enough. Joe was about, uh, about 195 pounds, but very strong and, um, and had tremendous uh, speed. A lot of people don't realize it, but when we had uh, winter workouts and things like that, Joe was really a step faster than James Brooks. With Cribs and Brooks in the backfield, along with quarterback Charlie Trotman, Coach Barfield enjoyed his finest season in 1979. As a person, Coach Barfield was the kind of guy that, that you wanted to play for because you respected him. You know, he was a, just a, a sensational person, a terrific person. Um, you know, he cared about his players. He was concerned about you as an individual. He wanted you to do well, um, you know, not only at Auburn, but, but later on. He had a lot of the intangibles that you look for as far as, uh, you know, what you would want in, in a head coach. In five seasons, Coach Barfield won 29 games. Winning was tough enough. Filling the shoes of a legend was impossible. A new era was dawning. It was time for a new beginning. 
It is what I consider one of the top jobs in the, in the South. It is a school that has tremendous football tradition. And it is a, is a school that I remember playing against and watching my older brothers play against back in the 50s and having coached against the University of Auburn at, at times when they were certainly a feared football power in the South. For Pat Dye, the road to Auburn led through Athens and Tuscaloosa. He knew what qualities Auburn people valued the most. In his playing days at Georgia, Auburn had made a lasting impression on this young guard. I know a lot about playing Auburn, and uh, it was the biggest game of the year for us, uh, in addition to Georgia Tech. And, uh, they were always big and strong and fast and, and had good players and played hard and uh, very aggressive, very physical. It was just the kind of football team he would mold at Auburn in the 1980s. There's going to be a lot of days when you lay your guts on the line and you come away empty-handed. Ain't a damn thing you can do about it but go back and lay them on the line again and again and again. We all learned how to work, and we learned something about being accountable and uh, being responsible. And uh, I guess that was, that was the start of learning how to win. That first year, they took their lumps. But in 1982, the Tigers began to growl again. A talented freshman named Bo Jackson joined halfback Lionel James in the offensive backfield, making the Auburn wishbone a real weapon. Tennessee fell to the Tigers as did Kentucky and Georgia Tech. November 27th at Legion Field, Auburn would find out just how far this team and this program had come. Alabama had won for nine years in a row. They were attempting to deliver an early knockout punch, but the Tigers were undaunted. They held their own, kept their poise, and with time running out in the fourth quarter, began a drive to destiny. On a play that would become known simply as bow over the top, nine years of suffering came to an end. The Tigers would never look back. As a sea of orange and blue celebrants are tearing down the goalposts, in this monumental victory, ladies and gentlemen, as the Auburn Tigers have defeated the Alabama Crimson Tide by the score of 23 to 22. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the game that sticks out the most in my whole five years at Auburn. You know, we played in the Sugar Bowl, the Tangerine Bowl. We beat Alabama again in 83, but none of those games uh, mean quite as much as that 82 game because we hadn't beaten them in 10 years and they were favored to win. Uh, that, was, that has to be the turning point in uh, Coach Dye's era at Auburn. In 1983, the Tigers won their first SEC championship since 1957. They did it following the same formula their counterparts used 26 years earlier. A low-risk offense and a suffocating defense. They faced the toughest schedule in the nation that season, yet they lost only once. The lessons and courage they learned in 81 and 82 had paid rich dividends. A 13-7 victory at Georgia would clinch the SEC championship. And I think of that moment at Sanford Stadium, uh, a cold autumn afternoon, uh, knowing that we had at least won a share of the SEC championship, 
And as I looked out across the room, I saw the likes of Donnie Humphrey and Dal Lockman and Doug Smith and guys who I'd been in the trenches with, so to speak, and guys who uh, you know I'd been through the lowest moments with, and now we are able to share some of the, the bright moments together. The Tigers' talents were showcased for the nation in the Sugar Bowl against Michigan. Their heart-stopping victory brought them as close to winning a national championship as you can get without actually winning it. Bo Jackson matured into a sophomore superstar in 1983. He was an impact player a franchise back. He saved his finest performance for the Crimson Tide. 256 yards on 20 carries. Still the most yards ever gained by an Auburn back against an SEC opponent. a guy like that in the backfield who can who can dominate a game on his own you know when you're looking at him in the huddle and you know he's there it just really gives you a little bit more confidence to go out and do your job and know that something big can really happen Bo could do it all he was a two-sport athlete who met life the only way he knew how head on Bo was a talent that gave us a chance to beat anybody we played. And uh, he, was, he was a player that people feared because of his physical talent and appearance and the kind of player he was. From Bo Jackson's first game at Auburn, the experts were already talking Heisman. As Pat Sullivan had done 14 years earlier, Bo wrapped up his Heisman in a classic Auburn victory in Athens. In the closest vote in the history of this trophy, the winner is from Auburn University, Bo Jackson. The Tigers would go on to make the 1980s the most successful decade in Auburn history. You are the champion of the best football conference in America. They won four SEC titles and made eight straight bowl appearances. class that graduated in 1990 could proudly say it had never lost to Alabama. In 1988, Auburn's defense rose to the dominating level of the legendary 1957 team. It too led the nation in virtually every defensive category. Led by Outland Trophy winner Tracy Rucker, 
It recorded three shutouts and allowed the fewest yards rushing of any team in Auburn history. It was also in this decade that the Auburn-Alabama game became the most famous rivalry in all of college football. Season after season, it provided excitement, high drama, and fantastic finishes. Berger, out of the eye, going to pitch to Jesse, and he's going to give it to Tillman on the end of the round. The 10, the 5, Tillman, he's in! Touchdown, Auburn! Touchdown, Auburn! Mario Tillman on the end of the round, reverse! 32 seconds left, Auburn is going to hit 20 to 17! On December 2nd, 1989, it would make history. Alabama would play at Auburn for the first time ever. The day has become a vision frozen in time. A swirling sea of orange and blue. Auburn people as far as the eye could see. and a football team that refused to be beaten on the greatest, most ultimate day in Auburn football history. What Shug Jordan, Jeff Beard, and others had dreamed about decades ago had finally become reality. One running back is like John Williams behind Reggie Flack. He'll toss sweep. Williams to the short side. He's at the 10. He's at the 5. He's in! Touchdown, Auburn! When it was over, the score was Auburn 30, Alabama 20. A day that will live in infamy for the previously undefeated Crimson Tide. A day of ultimate glory for the Auburn Tigers. Finally, they had all come to Auburn. The cycle was complete. First of all, I want to make a presentation. I want to present Coach Dow with the game ball. Yeah. Listen, man. Tonight's what our program's all about. I want you to I want you to think about it and let it sink in deep. This is the reason we work in the summertime in January and February and the spring. This is the reason we push you beyond what you think you can do to experience moments like this. Ain't no easy way in life, and it wasn't easy out there tonight, but you were prepared for the task at hand. Every one of you players, I mean, ain't no way, ain't no way for, I, ain't, I ain't smart enough to tell you how I feel about you. I mean, and, and because, I mean, it's family, every one of you. I mean, you know it. Sure, I'd like to be 12, 11 and old and, you know, not, but I'm gonna tell you something. I wouldn't swamp this year for any year that I've been at Auburn. I wouldn't swamp it, men, because I've watched you struggle and I watched you wrestle with them angels and, 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 but I watched you grow up and become men. I watched you become men. It's time, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember me standing right here and telling you when you became one that you'd know it? I mean, you know it now. It don't make any difference who's carrying the ball. It don't make any difference who's catching it, who's rushing the pass, or who's making the tackles, as long as you've got a blue jersey on.
For 100 years, the young men who have worn the blue jersey have shared the same goals and ideals. The qualities of heart have remained the same. Well, 25 years ago when I was being recruited, uh, you always talked about it being friendly. And when you come to Auburn, you're accepted as an Auburn person, whether you come from a family that's got $2 or whether you come from a family that's got $20 million. And ev everybody's accepted a as the same. I don't brag about too many things. I brag on my kids. I brag on Auburn. Um, uh, it's something that I get into with the guys here at the stadium every day. On game days, on Saturdays, I think one of the most special things I would ever do was put on the Auburn blue jersey, the home jersey and walk out on that field at Jordan-Hare Stadium on the student body side of the field as everybody in the stands literally applauded, went crazy, did whatever they wanted to do to support Auburn football. And without exception, the hair on my neck would stand out and up as I came out onto the field. And several times I had tears in my eyes walking onto that field at Jordan-Hare Stadium. To me, the, the Auburn tradition is just not words. It's a feeling, and, and as I say, to me, it's a fiber that's there and it's strong and it's everlasting. It's been with us a long time, and it gets stronger and stronger. 100 years ago, this is where tradition began. Down through the years, memories of wins and losses fade. What remains important are the relationships between teammates and with Auburn, especially with Auburn.